Springsteen would take a, a, a theme. So he would write about a, a particular theme. So if you take, for example, religion, he would write about, he would write a song in Steel Mill, Resurrection, which is a good song, nothing spectacular, but it's a decent song. And he would take that theme and he would write it and he would write it and he would write it until he reached a song that he believed was as good a song as he could possibly write. The other, the cowboy, the kind of Western themes is another one. He writes Western themes again and again until he gets to something like Evacuation of the West, which is just an incredible song that's not yet been released. They looked at it for tracks, but they never released it. With religion, he wrote it again and again. He wrote religious songs until he got to If I Was the Priest. After he got to that point, he barely touched these themes again, but he knew that he had to get better. So he was every time he would take a step up, he would write a new song, he would write a better song, he would write a better song, he would write a better song until he got to what he believed was as good as he could write in terms of that particular theme. And then he just moved on. He moved on to something else. And that was that was his getting better. That was him moving through the stages of songwriting from something like Resurrection through to a song which most people would argue is a classic, if I was the priest. Hello, everyone. And welcome to a new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. I am your host, Jesse Jackson. We are doing another Timey Wimey episode. It is my afternoon, my guest evening. And so he might be having a nice cup of tea to soothe his calm so that he his nerves so he can go right to sleep when we're finished. But Craig, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah, looking forward to this, Jesse. Yeah, tell us about yourself. I'm about six hours in front of you guys. I'm over in, in just outside Edinburgh in Scotland. And it's just it's that time of year where it's starting to get cold outside. And yeah, straight to bed after this. Trying to stay warm, yes? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I always think about, because in Texas, where I'm from, it's like always hot. It doesn't get that cold. And I always, every time I watch classic Doctor Who and see Tom Baker in that coat and that scarf, I was like, gosh, he just must, it must be a sauna. And I'm always had to reminded that it's often damp and cold where they're filming so it wasn't as bad for him as it is for us that's my doctor who as well so that's yes oh good we could spend a whole hour talking about doctor who (laughs) Uh, yeah that's great so yeah i i we're here to talk craig has a new version a new edition updated edition of his book springsteen saint in the city 1949 through 1974 so we're going to talk about the book we're going to talk about the changes but i always like to start at the beginning so tell me what part of the world did you grow up in and what kind of music was your family listening to when you were a youngster i grew up here i i live about seven miles outside Edinburgh and I was born in Edinburgh and my family lived just outside and I live probably a couple of miles away from where I lived in, as a child and it's a nice enough area it's decent enough and we just lived this kind of normal working class life when I was growing up mm-hmm. and my parents weren't particularly into music they, we had a record player and we had Buddy Holly, Jim Reeves all manner of different things. I remember having the South Pacific soundtrack, but they weren't big music buffs, okay. um, which is odd because I'm a huge music buff. Yeah. Where do you think you got your love of music from? I don't know. I think both of them liked it, but it wasn't. they weren't obsessive about it. But I just, I don't know why. I just became mm-hmm. obsessive. You've got to have something when you're growing up. And mine was listening to Springsteen and that type of music. Craig, did you, you mention... Much like Bruce makes that joke in his Broadway show that he's he lives within an X amount of miles from his hometown. Did you always uh, live there or did you go out exploring the world and then come back to home? I, I, I did. In about 1988, a friend and I traveled to America. We've got friends. There's a, there's, the University of Wisconsin was based in my hometown. Okay. And in 1988, we went, traveled over to see some friends there. 
people I'm still friends with, actually. So I went back in 89. Then in 1990, myself and my friend landed in Florida, and we traveled all through the country, right up through Memphis, Nashville, up to Detroit and Washington, D.C., and headed over to Wisconsin and spent a few months in there. But yeah, we've traveled all around the United States. Loved it. Absolutely love the United States. And we've been back many times as a family as well. We've got the kids. We've been to Florida and back to Wisconsin and so on. So we just keep coming back to the States. It's great. What I, I always like to, if you can remember, when did you first discover Bruce? And can you articulate what his, about his music spoke to you? Yeah, I do actually. 1985, and I there was a, I was watching a television program. I was I liked music at the time. I wasn't obsessive about it, but I liked kind of music. It was out there, chart music. And sure. And I remember this program on, and they had a big board, and there was a hundred songs on the board, and people could phone in and get to hear the song that was on the board. And there was a Bruce Springsteen song there, and I had never heard Bruce Springsteen, but it was Dancing in the Dark. And I thought, oh, because that's an okay song. That's not bad. It's like any other pop song. It'll come and it'll go and you'll never hear the Bruce Springsteen again. But then a few days later, I heard, I think it was a double A side, actually. It was Born in the USA and I'm on Fire. And it just it utterly blew me away. I'd never heard anything like it. The lyrics and Born in the USA and I'm on Fire was just a kind of different song from anything I'd ever heard before. And I never looked back. I got the album and then just kept buying albums and kept buying unreleased songs and just kept on buying and kept on buying and then just live versions and so on. Never stopped after that. I just loved the lyrics, loved the sound. I still love that sound. I still listen to people like Dylan and Mellencamp and Petty and all. Yeah. Just yeah. love that sound. You know, what I love that you mentioned is too often some of our Springsteen siblings will have a little bit of a disdain for Born in the USA because it's so commercial. And But I always like to remind people that Born in the USA was the gateway album for many fans, that, that people found that album and that what led them to E Street, that led them to hear Bruce and his music. And, and I actually think that while the songs may have been overplayed in your lifetime, they are darn good songs. Absolutely. I'm not saying that Born in the USA is my favorite album by any means, but I could sit and listen to it and I'll put it on in the car and quite easily listen to every song in that album. It's, it's absolutely fantastic, I, as well as the outtakes from that album. Also. Yeah, well, um, I know we're hoping for a Born in the USA box set sometime that, that we'd all love to see. Um, so, Craig, I always like to preface this with the amount of times you've seen Bruce perform live isn't a fair barometer of how big of a fan you are. There's plenty of people that, based on when they were born and where they lived, had the chance to see him dozens, if not hundreds of times. And then there's other people that have never had a chance to see him at all. But do you count how many times you've seen him? And if so, how many? I'm not obsessive about it. I know people who are and, and rank the, the number the number of concerts they've been to, and that's fine, absolutely fine. I, I, yeah. If I had been to 300 concerts, I would probably be keeping a score as well. 30, maybe. Okay. Yeah, maybe around about 30 or thereabouts, 25, 30. Have you seen any of the new tour? I saw three dates. I saw, it's probably not a, a go back to many times tour because of the, the static set list, which I, I didn't particularly mind. And I also got to see something in the night, uh, which was, I, th I think, has maybe been played twice. But I saw him two nights in Dublin, nights two and three in Dublin. And then I saw him in my hometown, which is Edinburgh, which, yeah. is, which is also a great concert. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, and you've mentioned that, but your thoughts on the quote unquote static set list this tour? I, I would I would rather he threw a couple of songs in every 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 new every new concert and then you know mixed it up just a little yeah. bit. It doesn't have to be a great deal, but by the end of the tour, you've got a set list that, that differs vastly from the set list at the beginning of the tour. It and sure did. Fans coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thoughts on the three shows you saw? 
Fantastic. You get the usual. You get fans in there who are incredibly annoying, jumping in for you, know, and it's just and that ruins a concert for you. And that happened in one of the three, I think. So, by and large, absolutely fantastic. In the Edinburgh concert, actually, I wasn't in the pit in the Edinburgh concert. I was in the pit in the two Dublin concerts. And I would say that the Edinburgh concert was, as, as Dan French was saying to me, you, it's hard to rank concerts against. Yeah. But the Edinburgh concert was a great concert. And I've seen them many times in Scotland, and I'd say that's probably the best outdoor concert I've seen them in Scotland, which I didn't expect because if I can generalise somewhat, people from the West Coast of Scotland tend to be more outgoing, and the Glasgow shows were never great shows un- unusually. And the Edinburgh show, where people are much more introverted, was a fantastic show. Quite bizarre, but that's how it was. Yeah. No, that's how I felt it was. No, I think that's great. Talk about what made you, you've become this massive fan. You're exploring everything you can find. Why did you decide to write a book? Number of reasons, actually. I just really enjoyed that period. I enjoyed the Steel Mill stuff, the Bruce Springsteen band stuff as well. But also those early years, greetings through to Born to Run, Darkness, and so on. But it just felt like the time. I think there were, there have been books that have been written about that era up to 74. Or, sorry, there had been stuff that had been written, but no book, really, that had been written about that era. Peter Carlin touched on it in his book. Uh, mine's, I was writing mine at the same time as Peter Carlin. There were other books that talked about it, but there were many mistakes in those books. And there were huge gaps. Nobody had ever talked about the roads. Yeah. Um, yeah. People talked about Earth, a couple of lines. Dr. Zoom and the Sonic Boom seemed to be this thing just because it was an unusual name. But it's actually a really small period of time. And the other reason as well that I, I, I wanted to write the book was that I felt we had the access to the internet. But also people were starting from, from Bruce Springsteen's kind of age group were starting to die off. Danny Federici, for example, passed away. And we were starting to see that age group. People were passing away. We needed to get the interviews now. And I I probably should mention what my idea behind writing the book was not to get just the big interviews, the Tinker West and and so on. Because my feeling was that actually, if you can get those interviews, but all you're going to be doing is rewriting or stuff that's been written previously in, in articles and so on. But my goal was really to interview this kind of, what I would call peripheral characters. So people who had played in bands with Springsteen but weren't particularly well known, had maybe seen them in concert, maybe followed the group around. It's just people who were on the periphery. And my feeling before I wrote the book was possibly if I get 10 or 15 years, I'll add up to one big interview. Actually, how it worked out was one of the, some one of those interviews, for example, almost half a chapter. So some of them were turned into such big interviews that they actually created the, this whole book. So it was, just a, it was just a great experience doing that. Yeah, it's almost the story before the story, right? Absolutely. It is that we hear a lot about that going to John Hammond's office and, hey, you need to be on Columbia Records. and But that time, it's almost comparable to the Beatles in Germany before they were the Beatles, like how they came. And I've often, speaking of Doctor Who, a buddy of mine, my my co-host of my Doctor Who podcast, we, we did an episode, where would we take the TARDIS? What concerts would we go see? And I said, one of them, I would love to have been, I would have loved to take the TARDIS to one of those clubs in Germany. And just watch the band in that freshness and that raw just ability when they were just, as they say, a few lads making music, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a comparison between Springsteen in those early years and the Beatles, because what they were doing was they were racking up their 10,000 hours and they were becoming proficient at what they were going to do as a kind of lifetime job. Um, and you can see in the hours he spent on stage in places like the upstage, even as a young boy in, in, in these kind of small kind of clubs, that, that hours and hours spent in these clubs, and then the upstage every night for five, six hours. Incredible. And by the time he became, by, by the time he went into Hammond's office, he was a serious, serious musician. So I just listened to an interview 
from, and I bring him up a lot lately, my newest musical obsession is Jason Isbell and like just a brilliant songwriter and performer. And they were interviewing him and he was talking about how since he owns the record label, he controls his output. So he doesn't put out an album till he's got 12 good songs. And if you have another record company, when you get six, okay, that's good enough. Let's move on. And he was talking about YouTube and that how it's very easy to make music and put it out. But he said the biggest problem that happens is if you're young and you put out something and it's good and people like it, you get a false sense of security because it needs to be bad so that you push yourself so that it's better each time. And listen, reading some of your book and listening to the interviews with Bruce and other people, right? They were bad at times and they had to get better. Talk mm -hmm. to me a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, a good example, actually. Well, I can give you a couple of examples. One is, let me think. I had a good example in my head there. I've got it completely, so you might want to cut this wee section. I will cut, I will make it, no, no right. problem. Yes. Let, let me write this down. And I'll, okay. I'll, I've got a couple of things here, and I'll forget the second one if I don't. Yeah, so sure. 54, 54 years old. You forget. So, I'm 64, so I understand, my friend. Yeah, okay. One of them, maybe just focus on one, actually. Springsteen would take a, a, a theme. So he would write about a, a particular theme. So if you take for example, religion. He would write about he would write a song in Steel Mill, Resurrection, which is a good song, nothing spectacular, but it's a decent song. And he would take that theme and he would write it and he would write it and he would write it until he reached a song that he believed was as good a song as he could possibly write. The other the cowboy, the kind of Western themes is another one. He writes Western themes again and again until he gets to something like Evacuation of the West, which is just an incredible song that's not yet been released. They looked at it for tracks, but they never released it. With religion, he wrote it again and again. He wrote religious songs until he got to If I Was the Priest. After he got to that point, he barely touched these themes again, but he knew that he had to get better. So he was every time he would take a step up, he would write a new song, he would write a better song, he would write a better song, he would write a better song until he got to what he believed was as good as he could write in terms of that particular theme. And then he just moved on. He moved on to something else. And that was that was his getting better. That was him moving through the stages of songwriting from something like Resurrection through to a song, which most people would argue is a classic, If I Was the Priest. Yeah, my bragging moment, I was in Houston and Austin where he did them. He did them. And I was... it. So I'm not complaining about the set list. I figure like I hit a jackpot. And so I'm, I, so yeah, I was thrilled and surprised it didn't stick around. I, I would have yeah. thought it would have. Um, I actually thought Songs for Orphans was better on the album than if I was the priest. And I would have loved to have heard that in concert because he's played that a couple of times and it was incredible. Yeah. I think the original songs, I think if I was the priest was better than the songs. Craig. What I love that idea, and I'd never heard that. And I, because often you can get a, you could see a critic complaining, why are you keep going to that same theme? Why are you keep going to that same theme? But it is, as you explained, that I know I have an idea that I want to write about blank, the West, religion whatever and then try to re go that story okay i've done that okay now i'm gonna start that same kernel and see where else i go and now maybe mix into one of the things that was very clear is brian wilson during his most creative time like working on smile and pet sounds as he would just cut in pieces. It was building a mosaic of music. Was that one of the things that surprised you most in your research and your interviews? In terms of the, the building of the yeah, song? Yeah, this working, yeah. 
that was when it, it certainly came about when I was listening to music and during the, the interviews and, and just reading and reading all the articles I could find. So it was certainly one of the things that came up. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it was surprising when I figured it out. It, was, it, it made sense. There was a lot of things that when, when people told me things in interviews that were much more surprising than that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was so, going to ask, what are a couple of things that surprised you in the research or with the interviews? I was speaking to a person called Jeannie Nash, who was in the, the Zoom chorus in the Dr. Zoom band. And she was telling me that when she was, when Bruce had been signed to Laurel Canyon with Mike Appel and so on, she went over to his house and they read through the, the legal documents. So that's interesting. It's not, it's not a huge thing. She just says, we've got some soup, we read over these legal documents. Great. But Springsteen's always made great play of this fact that signed the document for the hood of a car in, a, in an unlit parking lot. Well, that kind of lays waste to that argument. They actually took time to go over them and read them. And she, as she said, they read them line by line. That was a brilliant moment, getting that little snippet and being able which kind of lays waste to this big argument that cared nothing about, about contracts. It. I keep thinking, as you tell that story of the man who shot Liberty Valance movie, where you print the legend. And when I sometimes think all of us, you mentioned being 54, I'm 64, sometimes our memory is wrong, but we've remembered it that way so long, it's a truth to us. Yeah. And, I mean, I, and, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, but I was just going to say the other one that, that springs to mind there, actually, is, is one that, that Bruce has always said, I, I got thrown out my first band. And that might have been the case, but I interviewed Jay Gibson, who was the person who apparently threw him out of his first band, who said, it didn't happen. As you say, there's the legend, and then there's what actually happened. Yeah. And to be honest, it's probably something like that. Yeah, it really is. And it is very easy. Penn Gillette tells the story that as an early Dylan fan, he thought that Dylan got his heart broke. He cut open, the blood flowed onto the table, and blood on the tracks was done. And he said then when he got to see the research, notebooks of song and every word that Dylan worked on. And it, there, it doesn't take away the mystique. It's just, it is this, for example, Letter to You, it feels like they say, oh, just a bunch of us got together and we recorded. But then when you start looking like, wait a minute, maybe you did that on a few songs, but a few others, I'm not quite and I had a good friend, Sarah, who's a musician. She says, I never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When I appreciate the fact that you wanted to capture this beginnings and origin story. How did you go about finding the people to interview? The internet was really the, the place. I'm a researcher and, and my daytime job and I have been for years um, so I just love doing that so I, I was working for Bruce Space at the time and I was doing some I was myself and Albie Talone who used to be a roadie for the Bruce Springs for Bruce Springsteen were doing the early years so a lot of the stuff in the early years we, we contributed to that and then we came across this chap called Frank Craig uh, sorry Flash Craig and this chap fascinated me they said he filled in on a, on a couple of gigs for, for uh, Earth so I did a little bit of research and these kind of digitized newspaper websites and found them. And it just built from there. And I I tried to find somebody from the Rogues. And I think I had his name, Jay Gibson's name. And I just researched the internet for six months, solid six months. I researched and researched and researched. And I eventually found a minuscule line on a website saying I threw a major rock star out of a the band, the band, supposedly, but it didn't really happen. And I just contacted him and said, yeah, I'm back there. So, so it, there was a lot of research. Some people did. Others came really easily. They were on Facebook and it was easy to contact them or I had contacts through Albie Tone and so on. And once you contacted one person, you put them to another. And yeah, it was just, just 
rolled from there and, you know, just got loads of people on board and 99% said, yeah, absolutely, we'd love to talk to you because there was no NDAs in place because this was all prior to them. Yeah, so I love that idea that we're capturing that young energy. And I love the story about the contract going over. What was the goal? Like you mentioned, 49 to 74. In your mind, did you know when you wanted to end this chapter of the story as you were writing it? Not originally. I had actually originally decided to write the book up to the point it was signed. And looking back now, with the benefit of hindsight, that was completely wrong. But my editor at the time said to me, you need to take it up further. You need to take it up to the point he becomes famous, which mm -hmm. is around the time that Born to Run comes out. He becomes at least a cult figure at that point. And it was, he was absolutely right. So I, I extended it out. But because I stand, extended it out, I got at least two, but actually there were many, but I got two just fantastic interviews. Sam McKeith, who was Springsteen's booking agent, was just wonderful and told me some great stories. But I also got to write about, and I think it's one of the big stories in Springsteen's career, his whole career, is the story of when he he is given the interview for Brown University magazine, and he tears Columbia a new one, because they're treating him terribly at that time. They published this in a school magazine, Brown University magazine, but the person who was the head of Columbia Records at that, or CBS Records at that time, his son goes to Brown University and had seen Springsteen a couple of weeks before at Brown University and phoned up his dad and said, this can't be right. You've got to give this guy money to make another album. Now, whether the money that came to Springsteen afterwards was because the son phoned the father and, and berated him, nobody will ever know. The son doesn't know, nobody knows. But they went to an interview because the son phoned the father. They went to an interview with Michael Pell's lawyer and Springsteen in a, a restaurant in, in Manhattan, Italian restaurant. And Pell basically, everybody else would have said, we're, you know, really, it won't happen again. Pell doubled down and said, we're going to do it with Rolling Stone. And at that point, that seemed to be the point. So that was a great little interview, taking what would have been a minor story in, in a couple of, I think Dave Marsh had possibly mentioned this Brown University interview in a single line. But to take that and expand it outwards, it was a huge story that nobody had ever really picked up on before. Yeah, I love that. That is a great story. How did you, I've been lucky enough to have Mike on the podcast and I found him very forthright and very open, very little bitterness, just a truly, and I don't know if it helped because I, when I was interviewing him, I said, if we are an E Street Nation, Mike Appel is a Hamilton. He is a Jefferson. He is in the United States. Yeah. How was your talk with him? We communicated by email, but okay. he was absolutely fine. And there was, again, I agree within those emails, there was no bitterness, but there didn't seem to be any. And, and he was quite open when talking with me, as was Bob Spitz, who was one of the kind of three that were within that group. There was yeah. Jimmy Creticus as well, but nobody's ever seen Jimmy Creticus. So both Mike Appel and Bob Spitz were absolutely fantastic and happy to talk to you. Yeah. Really was enjoyed there, it. Was there anyone you wanted to speak to that you didn't get to? <laughs> no. I didn't Besides get, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get Vinny Lopez. And the reason I think I'll be to loan and cut it up. And I went, I was over in New Jersey and I went to see uh, Vinny playing that one night in the Wonder Bar. And it turned out that he was going to play with Springsteen that night in New Jersey. He was going to go on stage. And I thought, yeah. He's the, first. the other one was uh, George Thies. And I never quite figured out why. He agreed initially and then it didn't really come to anything. But that's fine. If people don't yeah. want to do it, I'm not a journalist. I'm not going to push people. And push it would have been interesting to hear George, especially now that we with letter to you and all the references to him it would have been it would have been nice to have that story yeah. because you could tell there there remained a bond between Bruce and him 
And so, yeah, that's nice. I think the problem with those, you'll get interviews with Josh Deese. You can go and read interviews with Josh Deese and, and Vinny yeah. Lopez. And, but I think they, there tends to be a repetition within those interviews. So you can read one, and it's basically the same interviews repeated again and again and again, because they're being asked the same questions again and again and again, because they're being interviewed for bigger publications. And all they want to hear is the general stuff. But as I was digging into the specifics, and that's, I think, why a lot of the stuff that came out from those interviews were really interesting. Yeah, Vinny sat with me a couple of years ago, and at the very beginning, I said, what are you tired of talking about? And he said, I'm tired of talking about it, all of it. And so I didn't. I talked. I did not ask him one question about leaving the band. Mm -hmm. I just asked about starting and playing and his current love of singing and golf. And the only thing I said, is there any specific album you look at that you go, damn, I would have liked to been part of that. And he said all of them. <laughs> and so that was as close to I got. I love Vinny as a drummer. I think Vinny, listening yeah. to Vinny, is, yeah, it, you know, I think very different from Max. But I, I think it's, you watch that video of Thundercrack and that color video. It's just really yeah. great. Yeah, just such a great guy. So what led you to refresh it? Why did you want to do a new edition? There's one specific story. I think I've always wanted to, I'd, I'd never felt it was perfect. I felt that there was a lot of grammatical stuff in there that I wanted to fix, but there were stories that I'd always wanted to get more on. But the person I'd really wanted to interview the first time round, I just assumed that he was dead. There was a chap called Phil Giambalvo. Now, Phil Giambalvo was the guy who recorded Springsteen at his first recording session for John Hammond. Now, because the thing Springsteen had said, Springsteen had said, oh, we were at the end of an era and all the recording guys had shirts and ties on. I assumed they were all old. But it turned out that Phil Giambalvo was only a few years older than Springsteen. He's still alive. And I, when I went back and tried to research if he was still alive, I found an interview with him on about even with his kind of hometown paper. And getting in touch with him and doing that interview was just, you know, okay, I need to redo this because there's probably so much more out there. Oh, and I also tracked down people like he he recorded a bunch of songs in about 1973 with Michael Hell in a recording studio called Media Sound. I tracked down the engineer for that as well. So I got a few good interviews. But the one that was actually quite interesting that I'd not been able to find out anything, and a lot of people don't really know this, Springsteen, when he was an heir, I, I, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but he, he was filmed what was essentially, I, I wouldn't quite say soft, Porn, but it was, it was a, there was new scenes in this. They were in the film Maurice recording. They were making this film, and Earth was in the background playing music. And I tracked down people from New Jersey who had travelled out, who knew Earth, who had travelled out and watched the band. And they were in the film Maurice watching it and getting absolutely drunk at the time on on the beer behind the bar and so on. And just got some great interviews in terms of that. So yeah, there were some really good, great new interviews, and it just made sense. That's great. So, yeah, Springsteen, Saint in the City, 1949 to 1974. Where all can you find the book, Craig? It's on Amazon. You can get on. You can get on Kindle. You can get it on hard copy. I did get a copy sent through because I, I sent a copy to a friend of mine, and yeah, well, I was quite pleased with that actually because it's a print on demand kind of thing. You know, I, I okay. Go and look for a publisher the second time round. So the only thing I was a wee bit unhappy with in terms of the book this time around with the print on demand was the cover because I didn't have the original sized images. So it's a wee bit off. Everything else is working okay. really well. Yeah. Okay, good. So I want to get back to Bruce. Are there favorite albums, songs that mean a lot to you that you go to back to routinely to for to help? revitalize your soul <laughs> yeah no, absolutely i think we all don't we i, I have i'll start by saying that i think the three album run from wild and innocent through to darkness is the greatest three album run by any artist ever okay um, so i'll start with that i yeah i think we can all go to the big song we can all go to so on. And, and i love them absolutely love those songs but i like dipping into the kind of the obscure ones i like dipping into to, to Sugarland or Good Man's Hard to Find or the Train Song. Or, and just so th these are the ones I've got on Spotify that come up on my thing more often than not. 
Mm. Evacuation of the West, just I, I think it's just a great song. So I would rather dip into them nowadays more because I've heard the other songs so many times in the early years. Sure. I've to listen to it. I love pretty much everything. I, there's not very much by Bruce that I, at least yeah. to some level. Excluding some of these obscure, is there a song you haven't got to hear live that you're still looking for? Of the kind of bigger songs, I would say probably Adam Raised a Cane I've not heard live. I would love to hear that live. Maybe The Last Carnival. I think that is probably, for me, that's the most underrated Springsteen song. And I'm not sure we ever played it live. But it's probably never going to happen. Adam Raised a Cane might. For me, but what haven't I asked you that I should have, Craig? Oh, I no, that that I think oh, you're probably gonna have to cut this gap. I'm trying to think actually. That's okay. Uh, I always and I tell the story. I had a guy on and we finished, and then after I stopped hitting record, he said, Oh, and next time I'm on, I'll have to tell you the time I went. I got drunk with the E Street Band. What? <laughs> How do you not lead with that story? So I just yeah, want to yeah. make sure you haven't gotten to get drunk with the E Street Band and you're not telling I've, me. I've, I've not, but I've, I have to say the one thing that, that, that really is great is that I've met so many people through this. Yes. I've met so many great people through, through writing it. I, I consider a bunch of people who have been friends now, Albie Colones. Great guy. If you get a chance to get Albie on your program, you should get him on. Sam McKeith, great guy. If you get him on as well, he's got some great stories. But just guys who just had small stories to tell me that I've went over to the States, I've met them, or I'm stay in contact with them. Joe McHugh, who organised a, a, a concert for Earth. Or Doug Oak, who used to watch Castile through, through text on your kitchen window. Those guys, I'm still staying in touch with most of them. But then I met people afterwards as well who just who, who loved the book. Just got in contact with me. I went across to the States one time and we was going to I was hoping to go and see Springsteen on Broadway. And unluckily, the week I got over to the States was the week that they did a shutdown of it. A friend over there, Bill Schreitmuller, who who was who had got in touch over the book and just loved it. Great C G R D boys and made so many great friends. It's been a it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life, is is writing the book and what's come from that. I appreciate that. You I appreciate so much you joining me. And I will say that I feel I'm biased, but overall, the Springsteen fandom community is such a loving and caring group of individuals that we have the love of this music in common, and it it goes past borders and political Absolutely. lines and everything, but just it is there. And yeah, I appreciate that. And I'm thrilled that we got to spend some time talking to it. I'm going to include a link to where we get the book. And once again, listeners, please go check it out. But before I send you off to tuck in the bed and get nice and cozy, I've got to ask you the Mary question. So Craig, I end every podcast. Jay Armstrong, who is a retired honor English teacher, When he was teaching, he would give his high school seniors a copy of the lyrics to Thunder Road, and they would read it. They would treat it as a poem. They would talk about the imagery that Bruce uses. They would talk about the themes, and then he would ask his students at the end of the class, does Mary get in the car? So that is your question, Craig. Do you think Mary gets in the car at the end of Thunder Road? My personality made me go and work on this. I, I, I'm not just coming to this without thinking about it seriously. I think there are clues. I think there are clues in Thunder Road, and I think there are clues in The Promise. Not that I say I think he set out to create clues. I just think that they're there. In Thunder Road, he has the line, sit tight, take hold, which to me reads that somebody's already in the car. However, a couple of lines later, he's telling her, he's asking her to get in the car kind of lays waste to that first first argument that she's already in the car. In The Promise, she says, Thunder Road, baby, he says, Thunder Road, baby, you were so right. And uh, I always took that as being that she had went with them, told them that it was, it was not going to work out and then left. Actually, it can be read the other way as well. 
that she's never going to enter something because it's going to be terrible. I'm not coming with you. I don't think the answer is actually in the song, and I think we've just got to make the decision one way or another whether we think she got in the car. I don't think she did. I think that he went himself with Billy, who he mentions in The Promise, and it all goes slightly awry for them. I love that answer. And thank you for doing the homework. I <laughs> love when people take the time to give it some thought. And and often people will come and say, I'm torn. I'm not sure. And that's the purpose. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Springsteen, Saint in the City, 1949 to 1974. Craig Statham, it is is a wonderful gift to the Springsteen fandom and to anyone interested in origin stories. You don't have to be a Bruce fan to enjoy this. Just the idea of how a young man found his path to sharing his musical gift to the world. And so thank you for the wonderful book. And I look forward to your welcome. Anytime you want to come back, we'll visit. It's It's been a joy. Thank you, kind sir. Listeners, go check out the book. Tell them that Set Lessing Bruce sent you. But for now, I want everyone to be kind. I want you to be safe. And we will talk to you soon. Goodbye.